pleased with. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to just pick just a portion of this verse out because we're breaking it down into a series and, and really kind of looking at different aspects of 1 Corinthians uh, 13. And as we do so tonight, we'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, we've got a little mishap with the, I think it's some, some reason it's not coming on, but that's, we'll get it now. Thanks, Brother Joe. Um, as we look at this tonight, we want to look at just a section of it and just a portion. In fact, we're going to look at one word. Uh, if you'll notice in chapter 13, verse 4, it says that, and is kind. Charity is kind. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and we'll get started this evening. Father, we want to praise you and thank you for your many blessings that you bestow upon us. Thank you for each one that's here tonight. As we study your word, Father, may we glean something from it that would be an asset, a benefit to us. We're going to talk tonight about charity is kind. And Father, may we know that is that kindness is love in action. And so may we have this kindness, may it permeate us uh, in our lives. And, and Lord, we just want to give you thanks uh, for what you will do uh, tonight among us and, uh, and in each one. Father, more than anything, we, we need to make sure that we have relationships that bring you honor and bring you glory. And Lord, like everything in our life, you want excellency uh, in it. And so may there be excellence uh, even in our relationships as well. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look tonight, again, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verse number 4. If you heard what I prayed, I prayed uh, and I made this statement is that kindness is basically love in action. Kindness is basically love in action. And isn't that kind of interesting because we notice around our city of Tucson that a lot of uh, schools especially, but even some businesses have been promoting this uh, concept of kindness. Uh, if you drive around enough, you'll see these kind of like a shamrock looking things. They, uh, they kind of glisten in the light or uh, in the sunlight and all the rest. And you'll have on there, be kind. And it's interesting that they're trying to force, if you would, individuals to be kind. Our problem is that we cannot be kind if we do not have the love that God has in us. Amen. No matter how much we try to be kind, it's not going to be something that naturally flows out of us until we have this charity within us. So as we look tonight, the word kind, it means to show oneself useful. It refers to doing something helpful, thoughtful, gracious, or sympathetic. And so it's not just a be kind and as of a, uh, if you would, an emotion. It, kindness, it's a verb, it's an action. And so notice, when we are kind one to another, it's based upon charity, but it's an action because of agape love or because of charity. You understand what I'm trying to get at? And so it's not just something that we can just say, I want to be kind today. Well, in reality, can I tell you what? We as people, as flesh people, this outer man people, we are selfish and prideful. And in reality, we don't want to be kind. Uh, you ever watch two kids play somewhere? Kid comes in, picks up a toy, and it could be a toy the other kid in the nursery or classroom or playground, whatever it is. They could be ignoring that toy, and yet when the other child comes in and picks up the toy, what's the first response of the child that was there first? That was him. That's mine. Leave it alone. There's no kindness that naturally flows out of that child. What does is selfishness. Amen. Uh, they don't want anybody else to touch their stuff, even though it's not their stuff. They begin to take, if you would, ownership of things that don't belong to them, because that's exactly our outer man, that, that flesh, if you would, uh, man has, is the attitude of not being kind one to another. Here's something I think is interesting. Patience will put up with all types of bad things from others, while kindness will do all types of good things for others, including those who hurt us. So patience puts up with things. If it just says here, we, we talked about last week, uh, charity does what? It suffereth long. And so notice, it will put up with a lot of things. But notice the flip side of that. Kindness is willing to do all types of good things to individuals. 
including those who hurt us. In Romans 12, 21, it says this, be not overcome of evil, but how do we overcome evil? We do it with good. And so it's not that we are allowing this uh, being overcome of evil, but we're to overcome evil with good. You say, well, wait a minute. When someone does me wrong, I'm going to get them. And when someone doesn't treat me right, I'm going to tell everybody. And when someone doesn't get the idea, and yet in reality, the opposite is absolutely true according to Romans chapter 12, verse 21. How do we overcome evil? We do it with good. That's the only way we can do it, is do it with good. So if we're kind, I want to look at four things tonight that really should be true in our lives when it comes to this. Notice number one, we will be encouragers. We will be encouragers. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, we'll look for opportunities to encourage people. We'll look for opportunities. Notice once again, we're talking about this kindness that should flow out of us, but it's not going to flow out of us because the natural man is selfish. So what do we have to do then? We must start beginning to train ourselves and begin to get that mindset that will look for opportunities, if you would, to encourage others. I told you a while back when we were in 29 Palms, I, I would put up, this is old time because it was. Uh, not like today, you can get banners and things like that. I guess we could have bought banners, but we just didn't. But so we had this computer, the printer. I uh, remember the old uh, printer that had those little like wheels on there. You know, I'm not sure what they called those things. Was it like a dot matrix printer? Is that what it's called? It had like a long pieces on the side you tore apart, but you could make man those. All the pieces of the paper would stuck together, and so I made this big old long one and made block letters that were empty and uh, went there and began to color them all in and made sure that, you know, it was like, I think it was all black. And then uh, the last one was a bright red color. And it was just this, pray for opportunities. And I began to put that across the banner, across the stage. So every time someone looked at me, uh, God forbid they had to, but if they looked at me, uh, they saw that banner across there, uh, pray for opportunities. And pretty soon I had people start asking me, what opportunities are we to pray for? And I said, pray for opportunities. Well, that could be a whole, whole gamut of things, could it not? Pray for an opportunity to be a witness. Pray for an opportunity for a promotion. Pray for an opportunity to be kind. Pray for an opportunity for what? See, notice our natural man is really selfish, and so we've got to begin to look for opportunities to encourage individuals. Everybody understand that? I mean, we are. I mean, we agree we're all nat that naturally we're selfish. Yeah, we, we're selfish. We're self-centered. We want everything ourselves, and so we've got to start looking then for opportunities so that we can encourage individuals. So notice what we got to do then. We have to step back a little bit, and we've got to start observing people and seeing what they need. We've got to get out of our own comfort zone. We've got to start getting out of our own way, if you would and allow God to begin to move us towards individuals that he wants us to be able to focus upon those. This is this. One of the best ways that we can be an encourager is to take the time to listen to hurting or discouraged people. In the Psalms 10, uh, 17 says, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou will prepare their heart. Thou will cause thine ear to hear. So notice. The psalmist says, Lord, you're the one that hears the desire of the, of the troubled, of those or the humble. Uh, you're prepared their heart, and you'll cause thine ear, his ear, to be able to hear those individuals. And here's something interesting. Well, we think, and I can guarantee you this, we're pretty much all men in here uh, tonight. We've got a couple of teenagers, but mostly men. And this is something you guys don't forget because that's to be a benefit to you one day as well. Do you know what our wives want more than anything else? They really don't want chocolates and flowers. Uh, they really don't want us to take a, to, for us to take them out to, uh, to some place just to sit about to talk about work or our job or anything else. You know what our wives really want? They just want us to be with them and for us to listen to what they have to say. That's a cheap date. Amen? But it works, and that's exactly what they want. They want our attention. Uh, they want to speak to us, talk to us. How I many you know that's true? That's what they want. I mean, you say, well, don't they want chocolates and flowers and all that stuff? Oh, they might like that, but they really want more than anything 
is not necessarily a, 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 this big old quantity of all of our time. They want us to have some quality time with them, to spend time with them, focusing on them. You know what that means? Turn the TV off, put the phone down, close the book, whatever you're doing, and begin to look at them, focus upon them. But you know, it's interesting, if our spouses desire that, I can almost guarantee you that the majority of people today in the world, that's exactly what they want as well. They want someone just to listen to them. They want someone to communicate. Communicate how? By paying attention to what they're saying. And it's not just hearing, it's listening to them. Hearing's different. We hear everything. My wife said the other day, did you hear me? Of course I hear you. I hear you all the time. But you're not listening. Well, that's the difference. I hear you. I hear your, I hear your voice. I hear the octaves in your voice. Uh, I hear every bit of your voice. But am I really listening to what she's saying? And that's exactly what people want. They don't want just, just to, for us to hear them because we hear everybody and we hear numerous noise. Tonight we got to church about 4.30 or so and I'm in my office and Vicki's sitting there doing some book work and uh, getting ready for the first of the month. And, and she says, do you have music playing in there? And I said, no. I hear music. I said, I don't know. I don't have any music. And so I kind of walked around the building and thought, I don't hear any music, but maybe she hear me hear music. And I said, I don't hear any music. Well, I hear it. I hear it. Isn't that how we are too? I hear it, but I'm not really listening to it. I said, well, what are they singing? She had no clue what they're singing. She just heard it. You know why? Because she really wasn't listening to it. She was just hearing. That's so why I told her, quit listening to the voices. No, never mind. Anyway. So uh, most people are hurt or discouraged, don't need a great word of wisdom. They don't need some uh, philosophical insight. They don't need a pep talk. And they don't even need a sermon on why they should not be discouraged. What they really need is an individual who cares enough to take time to listen to them. Amen? That's what they need. You say, well, well you just get over it. Suck it up, buttercup, and uh, shake yourself out and get back up again. And, but notice, they don't need all that. They just need someone to listen to them. Here's something interesting. The majority of time when you do counseling, giving advice to someone is not a benefit. Letting them talk it out themselves and come to a conclusion is greatly rewarding. You know that? You hear what I said? Trying to give people, well, let me tell you what to do, and here's 55 things to do, and a hop, skip, and a jump, but letting them talk it out. And letting them come to a conclusion themselves, what a better asset that it is. What a better reward it is for them. Because here we are not trying to figure it out for them. We're allowing them to figure it out themselves. Our responsibility is just to listen to what they say and maybe guide them to a conclusion or something else. But it's not trying to figure it out. Majority of people don't want us to do that. All they want us to do is listen to them. We can encourage people by words of encouragement. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. One of the best ways to encourage others is through a handwritten note or letter. You say, well, what about handwritten? No one does that today. Man, it's email or text or this or that. A handwritten letter. I guarantee you, people like that. There's somebody that I know that writes handwritten letters, numerous people throughout the world, Brother Tiki does. He writes out notes. He's got some pen pals in Australia. He's got somebody in Russia. He's communicating with people. He'll sit down and just write, handwrite with ink. In fact, he has, let me have noticed what he has. He has an old type of that quail kind of a pen, not with the, not with the feathers sticking out, but that old type. I'm not sure what they call them, the old pen and ink, you know, has actually an ink cartridge uh, in that pen, and he'll use that to write letters and things to people. And what an encouragement that it is. And so notice, handwritten words of encouragement and appreciation, they'll last much longer than the spoken words. You know why? People will hang on to those things. They hang on to them. I have stuff that I've got a hold of that I had a card this kid gave to me. He was a senior in high school. Back in 1992, and I still have that card. I still have a hold of that card. 
the words in there was words of encouragement. And what a blessing that it was and how much I appreciate him doing that. And so I kept a hold of that. Why? It meant something. It meant something that he took the time to do it. I happen to know the kid pretty well. It didn't have a lot of money. It cost him something to buy that card. It cost him time to write that note. It wasn't this long, flowery note, but it was not. It was just words of encouragement. So we can encourage people by words of encouragement. People enjoy that. They like it. Handwritten note. Hey, I, I'm praying for you, thinking about you, uh, whatever else that it is. It doesn't mean that you have to find a card or make up this long letter or, or do whatever else. Uh, you can go ahead and have a card. It could have, it could have writing. It could be a hallmark moment for all that matter. Just like underneath that, all that stuff, just write a little note. It's an encouragement to people. It'll be a blessing and an asset to them. So notice, how can we have kindness and love and action? Number one, uh, we can then become encouragers. Number two, we can show compassion. We can show compassion. And I know, men, we are the most compassionate people upon the face of the earth. Our children come to us, and they're bleeding and crying, and they've skipped up their legs or their arms, and They've done something, and what do we say? Just suck it up. Get back out there again. There's no problem here. But that's not really how we ought to be. You know, they normally go to the mom to get the bandage, kiss the boo-boos, and all that kind of stuff. I'm not kissing uh, any blood on any kid or anything else like that. And so, but we ought to show some compassion. Go with me over to, to Luke chapter 10, and notice a great illustration when it comes to compassion, and what Jesus was doing in Luke chapter 10, he was speaking to an individual, a young individual, according to verse number 25, and we notice that this guy, he was a certain lawyer, stood up, tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Then Jesus said unto him, what is written in the law, how readest thou? He answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. In fact, verse number 27 is really a synopsis or an outline of the Ten Commandments. Uh, the first half of the Ten Commandments is a focus on God. The second half of the Ten Commandments is focused on others. And so what does he say? We ought to love the Lord thy God. And no doubt that notice the response that Jesus gave to this individual in verse number 28, he said, thou hast answered right. That's a good answer. You've answered exactly the way that it ought to be answered. Then he goes on to say this, this do. Oh, wait a minute. Time out here. Don't you like it when you go somewhere and say, that's a great answer. I don't want to be told to do it. I think it's just a great answer. So what should we do? We got to love everybody. That's really good. But now the doing part, I think that's the difficult aspect of it. That's what Jesus is telling him. Yeah, what you responded with is absolutely correct. It is great. Then Jesus says to him, now you're to go out there and do this, and thou shalt live. But notice what this individual said, him willing to just justify himself, said unto, to Jesus, I want you to specifically tell me who is my neighbor. I, I don't want this vaguely because I want to make sure that uh, I'm going to someone that's exactly like me, uh, that has the same mindset as me, uh, maybe in the same circle that I'm in. Uh, I don't want to do anything. I don't want to go outside my comfort zone. And notice what Jesus says. He's going to begin to tell him who exactly is his neighbor. And who Jesus begins to explain is, is exactly opposite than what this individual was hoping for. No doubt he was hoping that it would be maybe his wife or a child or the individual he's lived next door to for 50 years or 20 years or 10 years or whatever that it is. He was hoping he wouldn't have to go outside of that realm, if you would. And then Jesus begins to lay out a parable, and he says to him, here is the individual that you're to assist. He said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Then notice in verse 31, And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, 
And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, he came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Notice verse number 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an end and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, this is the good Samaritan departed, he took out two pence and gave, him, gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? So notice what takes place here in verse 37. He said, He that showeth mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. So notice what happened. This certain individual, he's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And we notice that this place, if you're to look, you see from Jerusalem to Jericho is a mountainous kind of place. They, uh, they have to walk through a mountain area to get from one place to another, from Jerusalem to Jericho. And so it seems as if that in this area, that that exactly where this guy is literally mud. He's jumped. He's stripped of his clothes, stripped of his wealth, stripped of everything imaginable. And they beat him and they leave him for dead. And, you know, you might say, well, what a dummy. Why would he ever travel by himself? Why would he not have a companion? Or why wouldn't he have all these things? But the idea is what Jesus is trying to put across. No matter what this individual did, or no matter what we think of him, that there's to be some compassion showed to this individual. So notice, we see that three different individuals came by him while this man laid there. Now, I'm not sure when I read this, uh, I'm just going to say, I don't think that he's in any state of being aware of who is walking near him or not. Uh, I don't think that he really realizes that uh, anyone has walking by him or looking upon him, because I think what took place is that he was beaten uh, and really was left, the Bible tells us here, look with me in verse number 30, uh, they stripped him of his raiment, they wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. So he could have been in a coma state, if you would, not aware, had a concussion, uh, not aware of anything around him whatsoever. And so the first individual that came by was a priest in verse 31. This priest, by the way, was a clergyman responsible for offering sacrifices uh, at the temple. And you say, well, the reason why he didn't stop and take care of this, because if he was to touch this man uh, that was bleeding and could have he what he could have thought was dead, because he didn't check to see if he was dead, he's laying there half dead. Uh, no doubt he's beaten, he's bloody. There's uh, all kinds of contusions and all kinds of things with this individual. And maybe he's the priest, if he touched him, then he might be considered unclean. And if it was his course, it was his time to offer a sacrifice in the temple, uh, then he would not be able to do so. That'd be a great excuse, would it not? Uh, I can't touch this guy. If I touch him, then it makes me unclean, and he's unclean, and I just don't want to do it. A great excuse that this individual could have had. So when he saw the man, he avoided him by passing by on the other side of the road. You say, you mean passing by? And no doubt he saw him, and he avoided him as much as possible. Now, there's other excuses why he could have done that as well. Uh, he could have thought that individual laying there could have been a decoy. Uh, if he went there and bent down to this guy that had been beaten up and uh, began to help him out, that the other robbers or thieves could have also jumped out and attacked him, stole everything of his things as, as well. So he could have an excuse. But notice Jesus said this priest came by, and you would think that a priest of all people would be willing to assist this individual. The second guy that walks by is a Levite. He's a layman who's responsible for the care and the upkeep. He's kind of the maintenance individual, if you would, of the temple. And when he saw the man, what did he do? He avoided him as well, passing by on the other side. Then we get to the third individual, and he's a Samaritan. 
Look at verse 33. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He didn't avoid him. He didn't walk by the other side. He didn't do what, else, what he could to make sure he did not come in contact with this person. He went to him, verse 34. He bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. He set him on his own beast. He brought him to an inn. He took care of him. And so we notice that this man, he was hated by the Jews. He was half Jewish, half Gentile. He came to the injured man, bandaged him up, placed him on his own animal, took him to an inn, and cared for him. And then notice it went one step further. You say, man, that's, that's a lot that he did. I mean, he went ahead out of his way. He picked him up, placed him on his beast. He did all of these things to this person. It cost him something. It cost him oil and wine. Uh, he had to anoint him, clean him up, use the wine to, for a disinfectant, the oil for a medication. And he had to go through all of these things with this person. And then not only that, he had to be, begin to take this individual, lay him on his own beast, and then walk in front of the beast. He was traveling on the beast, obviously, or doing something with the beast. Maybe the beast was uh, carrying some kind of goods to the market. And now he has to take those goods and carry them himself and place now this man upon this beast, upon this animal. And then verse 35 says, not only did he do all of these things, he took him to the inn, which means he paid some money to have him in this place. And he took out two pence and gave them to the host, and he gave said unto him, take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Obviously, verse 35 kind of makes an insinuation. It lets us know that this individual must have known this host. It was not a one-time stay, if you would. He might have stayed at this place numerous occasions because there must have been some rapport that he could be trusted that if he came back by soon that he would receive some finances to pay or to compensate this innkeeper, if you would, this host for whatever that he spent. And then notice, at the conclusion of the parable, Jesus says in verse number 37, go and do thou likewise. See, Jesus never said to try to figure out how they got into their predicament, lecture them because of their situation, ignore them, or even judge them. Jesus said that we're to show compassion to those who need it. And if we're really going to show kindness to folks, number one, we've got to be encouragers. Number two, we've got to show compassion. Show compassion. You know, one thing that I've learned throughout the years I've been on this earth, people are hurting. And they're hurting more today than they've ever hurt before. There's an emptiness, a void in their life. They're, they're looking for something. They're longing for something. And they've been, they have been rejected by people. They've been rejected by society. They've been rejected by Christians, rejected by a church. Folks today are absolutely hurting. And if we don't show compassion to them, I can guarantee you what? There'll be something, somebody knocking on their door. Then, hey, we're here to help you. I might have me a little bit name tag. Haven't shaved uh, and never shaved, and, but I'm called an elder. You know what I'm talking about? Here, let me sit around your kitchen table with you and tell you some information. And, and I'll come by with you know, about every day and bug you to death and leave my magazine with you. Get the idea? I mean, that's exactly what they'll do. Uh, they'll come and swoop in and, and show compassion to individuals when it's really our responsibility as born-again believers that we are to show compassion to a world who needs it. And Jesus wants us to make sure we know, go and do likewise. We're not to sit there and judge how the situation or how he got into that predicament. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to show compassion to those individuals and help them to get out of it. Notice, if we are kind, we'll have compassion for the needs of others, <clears throat> and we will do something to help them, something more than just talk. Something more than just talk. The third thing we notice on the backside of your, on your sheet is that we'll not only be encouragers, not only will we show compassion, number three, we'll be forgiving. We will be forgiving. We'll be forgiving. Kindness is very similar to patience, 
as it will overlook many faults. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted. Then notice the third phrase that Paul writes, the church at Ephesus, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So our responsibility is to be forgiving. Why? Because that's exactly what Christ has done for us. See, we're to be kind to one another, not hold grudges. And as we exhibit the characteristic of kindness in our lives, we will not grieve the Holy Spirit because we will not allow our attitude, our emotions, our actions, or even our speech to become a hindrance. Ephesians 4.30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed under the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be a done way, be, done, be put away uh, from you with all malice. And so notice something interesting, that if, we're, if we don't allow these things to be taken out of our lives, then we will grieve the Holy Spirit of God. They're tied together. It's just not, you know, uh, just don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, and, and there's no things that we can do that. To, but notice what he says. He says, don't let this bitterness, uh, don't let this wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, then it ought to be put away from us. Because if we don't, if we hold on to it, I guarantee you this, we will begin to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And what's interesting, the people that we hold the most bitterness and anger and clamor and evil speaking are the ones that we hang on to for, with grudges and vengeance and all the rest are usually those individuals that are the closest to us. Those individuals that we're familiar with, that we know, and we hold these things and we hang on to those. And when we do so, guess what? We are grieving the Holy Spirit of God. See, kindness is always willing to forgive. God bestows his kindness to us so that we will repent. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? You know why God bestows his goodness to us, his kindness to us? It's so that we'll turn away from our sin. And so we won't be caught up in doing the things that we used to do, that he'll be led, that we can be led to repentance led to that point where we no longer do those things that grieve the Holy Spirit of God, those things that no longer grieve the God the Father, God the Son, that will not have these things in our life. See, people who are not willing to forgive are not kind and are therefore lacking in love. The place where people ought to experience forgiveness more than anywhere else is first in the family, second in the church. Amen? First in a family, second in a church. I have brothers and sisters, and it's always interesting to me that when they begin to talk, I listen to what they say, and even my sister that I'm the closest to, I, I hear her say things like, you know, and growing up, uh, mom shouldn't have done this, and mom shouldn't have done that, and, and all that stuff. And I was thinking, our mom's been dead for, gosh, almost 50 years. How much, how much can we beat our mom, you know, if you would, over something that she can't do anything about? Amen? And yet, how many times do we hold on to things? It causes us to, to just become bitter and angry and begin to exhibit those things that Paul says in chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 31, that we're to be done away with. We're to release. Hey, look, many times people do things to us, and they don't even know they've done it. They're not even aware of it. They have no idea, no concept whatsoever. The other day I was coming down at uh, Thornydale, coming to church. In fact, it's Monday morning. It's about 7.30 or so. And this woman is pulling out on uh, Pecos. Pecos is kind of a, a bad road right there. It kind of uh, jets out in an angle. And the way to be able to see traffic on both ways is you have to gradually begin to move out into the traffic. Uh, move out into the road, move out into Thornydale so you could see north and begin to see south. And she obviously didn't see me. I was driving uh, our car. It's brown, a brown car. And so I'm driving up, and pretty soon I noticed that she is, like, getting out there in the intersection uh, to the point, and she's not stopping. She's just kind of rolling out there. And so I'm getting pretty close to her, and finally I just hit the horn. And she just, you know, you could tell that she was doing it on purpose. 
because she said, look at me, you know. No, she like this. She went, whoa. I mean, she was like, whoa, mistake, accident, problem. It wasn't doing something on purpose. And yet, how many times do we see folks when something like that happens? Man, we're irate and we're mad. And, you know, we're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and we lose our testimony because it causes anger in our life. And so notice the opposite ought to be is forgiving. And remember that when we're not forgiving, we're not kind. Therefore, we lack in love. Fourthly, we will seek to ease the burdens of others. We will seek to ease the burdens of others. Again, if we're seeking, then we're looking for opportunities, like I said a few minutes ago. Look for opportunities to encourage people. Hey, look for opportunities to have compassion on people. How about looking for opportunities for, to forgive people? How about looking for opportunities to ease the burdens of others? Here's something, the, the root of the Greek word translated kind in 1 Corinthians 13, four, uh, chapter 4, uh, verse number 4, pardon me, is translated easy in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30. Matthew chapter 11, verse 30 says this, my, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A yoke, of course, was a heavy wooden harness that fit over the shoulders of an ox or oxen. And it was attached to a piece of equipment that the oxen uh, were to pull. A farmer in ancient times would train a new, inexperienced ox by putting it in a yoke with an experienced ox. The inexperienced ox did not carry the load but was simply learning how to plow or to pull by walking alongside the experienced ox. Jesus is saying this. He said when he uses the word easy, he's saying his yoke is kind. It's not burdensome. Could you imagine if Jesus did not bestow kindness upon us? Well, listen to this. If we're talking about love in action, Notice when Jesus was up on the cross of Calvary, one of the seven sayings upon the cross was this, Father, get vengeance upon them because they know exactly what they're involved in by putting me on the cross. Is that what he said? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And notice, it's, it's, his yoke is easy. He wants to forgive us. He wants to bestow kindness upon us. And when he uses the idea of the word easy, saying his yoke is kind, it's not burdensome. He didn't say they don't have to hold on to the guilt of what they are doing. Father, release them. Forgive them. Don't hold it against their account. Let them go. Hey, if we're truly going to see and truly going to begin to uh, show kindness and build some excellent relationships, Man, we've got to begin to seek to ease the burden of others. We've got to be able to help people, to assist them whatever way that we can, so they can have an easy burden, if you would. See, kindness seeks to ease the burdens of others. When we are kind, we reap kindness from other people. Remember in Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that will be what he reaps. So whatever we put into someone else's life, I can guarantee it, that's what we'll get out. If we want people to be kind to us, man, then we've got to sow kindness in them. If we want harmony in our home, we've got to, we've got to sow harmony to get it out of our home. If we want love in our home, sow love in our house. If we want better relationships, excellent relationships, and we want relationships that just flourish and, and grow and mature and become what we desire for them to be, Man, we've got to sow into those things with that. We just can't expect to sow or not sow anything and reap the reward and reap the benefit. We've got to put something in to get something out. Every farmer to get a crop has to first put seed into that ground. If he puts no seed into the ground, he's not going to receive a crop. I tell you what he will receive, the same thing that we have all over our yards. Uh, here in this beautiful state of Arizona, specifically in Tucson, a little bit of rain, I tell you what we reap is weeds. It's not something we want. It's not something that's a benefit to us, not something that's an, added, that's an asset to us, but it's something that we get. And I can guarantee you this, 
in our relationship, if we don't sow into them, we're going to end up reaping the weeds, reaping those things we don't desire, reaping those things we don't want. I don't know about you. Never noticed something kind of interesting about our weed situation in Arizona. I don't know about you, but every time that it rains, we get a new variety of weed. We got this thing coming up. It just kind of goes out every which way. And it's kind of a cool looking plant. It's got some green leaves and, and everything. And I just noticed this uh, just the last time we had a little bit of just a little bit of rain, you know, damped a little bit. And pretty soon this thing started blossoming in these pretty little red flowers. You know what I'm talking about? And they're long stems that come out there. Well, the interesting, interesting thing about these, these weeds are these little red flowers that look pretty cool, that when the sun comes out in about two days or so, and it begins to just, just get down and just start heating up this weed, those little beautiful red flowers are going to end up becoming burrs. And those burrs stick to your clothes. They're sticky. And pretty soon when you walk through a field of them or your backyard, if you don't cut them out, you're going to have all those little things on your feet, uh, on your clothes, and they just kind of stick to it. And they're sticky, and they're hard to get off. Notice, I can guarantee this. I didn't take any seed and plant that there, but I've sure reaped nothing but a mess. And that's all that it does is causes a mess. You track it in the house. You put it next to other clothes, and it rubs off on them. And pretty soon, it just like just gets everywhere. Just a mess. I think that's exactly with our relationships. When we don't sow what we need to, we reap something we don't want. How are we going to build excellent relationships? With a little bit of kindness. And kindness goes a long way. Father, tonight we thank you for your word again. Thank you, Father, that you've laid out some characteristics of charity, things that this love that you told us that you've instilled in us. Lord, we know the world doesn't have it. It's strange to them. It's an oddity to them. But Lord, you've given it to us. And Lord, because you've given it to us, then we in turn are to have those characteristics in us because it shows that we belong to you. Father, tonight as we look at charity is kind. Lord, we see that's love in action. It's not just something that we expect to others to have, or even ourselves to have. We as people are prideful. We're selfish. We don't want to give kindness to others because we expect people to give it back to us. And yet in reality, we're to be kind one to another, whether we receive it or not. Help us not to sow wheat. Help us not to sow and reap those things that we don't want in our relationship. Let's take time to, show, to sow long-suffering, patience, and kindness so that we can build and have 